There are over 130,000 people living with multiple sclerosis in the UK, and I'm one of them. I knew I had MS at 17, but it's only recently that I shared my story with the world. I'm not going to let MS stop me from achieving my dreams. I want to find out the truth about this condition and what it means for people living with it. I'm Lena Nilsson and this is my story. Athletics was my first love. I was fascinated with running since the age of 11. I was advised to stop training after receiving my diagnosis in case it made my condition worse. At that time, it felt like a life sentence. But why do we always think of the worst at times like this? I'm on a mission to change the narrative. My family are my rock, and I know they'll always be there for me. What was I like as a child? I don't even remember. Um, she was talking too much. <laughs> <laughs> Asking everybody in the street, hello, what's your name? I remember when you your first time had that attack, you was sleeping, and it was 8 o'clock, and I, I was down the stairs, and I called, love you, she's get ready to go to school. Yeah. And she told me, Lena, she cannot get up from the bed. And you told me you cannot move your arm, and you cannot move your hand. I was very worried, and I said, maybe, you know, this is like, you become paralyzed or something. Guess I don't know. I don't yeah. know, something happened, you know. I think because initially, we thought it was a stroke. That's what your first thought was, wasn't it? That yeah, because it, it was a stroke. It was my left arm that yeah. was weak, so that's associated with a stroke. So yeah, a few stroke. of the doctors said that. So not too long after that was when I received the diagnosis. And mum, you were with me in the doctor's office when we received the diagnosis that I had MS, multiple sclerosis. Did you know what it was? Uh, no, until I searched in Google just to see, you know, why that has come to the people and which kind of that disease and what the treatment you're going to take it and, you know, all that things that also make me very worried. But, you know, I'm, I'm just try to keep not, not to show you that my worries or what I'm scared of and, you know, and I'm really I'm very proud of you because I, I ask you to stop and, and you refuse to stop and, and I encourage you to do what you want to do. Last year, I told the world that I had MS after almost a decade of keeping it private. One of the early people to know was my twin sister, Lavia. When I first told you about my diagnosis, do you remember when, when it was? Yeah, vaguely, it was in the back of a car. And <laughs> I think the words you used were, do you even know what I have? And I was like, no, you didn't tell me. And like, I had multiple sclerosis. And I was like, what's that? <laughs> and it was, um, I think it was just a confusing time because I'd heard it sort of like floating around, but I didn't quite understand how a 17 year old would have yeah. MS. And I remember telling you, because the doctors were like to me, oh, um, your twin sister is going to be at a higher chance of getting it. And I was like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> you're not only my twin sister, you're my best friend. Um, do you remember kind of supporting me through any of those relapses that I had, like how you helped me get, get through some of those? Yeah, I think initially, like, because I didn't know what it was, I went onto Google to search up the disease and it said that you might end up in a wheelchair. And I didn't really know what to think of that and then you told me that there are different types of MS. Yeah and, and I got diagnosed with relapsing and remitting MS. So let's take it back to my most recent relapse um, in Oregon, the World Championships. Uh, you knew straight away that something was wrong didn't you? Yeah it was your first World Championships and you'd worked so hard to get there and I remember you woke, you woke up I think it was two days before your heats and mm. I immediately sensed that something was wrong in the room. Initially I thought maybe it was nerves but then when you said you couldn't feel your torso that was it brought back all those memories of being 17 and not really knowing what was happening and that was that was really scary i've had a lot of time to think since my diagnosis now it was time to travel around the country to find out what the future may hold so today we're here at a research institute at the university of nottingham to talk to dr nikos evangelou and dr blanca de dios perez about their ongoing research with ms and the psychology behind ms until recently, we were saying that this is an autoimmune condition, so it is an immune system. So our immune system fights infections, fights you know, bugs and viruses and, and so on. But sometimes it turns against uh, ourselves. So one of the things that people said to me was, how are you still doing what you're doing? And I tried to explain there's inflammation, and once that inflammation goes down, you can regain function of that nerve. I hope you have never injured your knee or your... <laughs> i got a sprained ankle at the moment. But <laughs> the, the, your, your sprained ankle, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, did it swell? It's, it was very surprising how much. Exactly like you have the swollen ankle. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have the initial some inflammation, in the beginning there is a bit of a swelling. So for example, this uh, small spot here, mm -hmm. I don't know when it was developed, I don't know whether it was a year ago or ten years ago, it was significantly bigger, so there is a bit of a swelling. Mm -hmm. And this swelling 
causes disruption of the function of all the nerves that they go there, exactly like your ankle. Is the research steering towards a cure for MS? If, as we were discussing before, we have now a virus, and it might not be the full story, there might be a virus in something else that is playing such an important role, one can start speculating, okay, if we have a vaccine and we can stop this virus, or if we find how this virus causes the inflammation in, in the brain, mm -hmm. then the, the, we, we're getting close. There's a lot of stigma that surrounds MS. Would you say that sticking to work or exercise and movement, in my example, would you say that that can become a really good coping strategy for people who are newly diagnosed or have been living with MS for a while? Work is good for health. I mean, and exercise is also very good for, for health. And for people with MS, it helps you with mood, overall quality of life and fatigue as well. Mm -hmm. So if you continue exercising, that can be your approach towards managing your symptoms. When I got diagnosed, it was with relapsing remitting yeah. MS. Um, and so I'd go on Google, as everyone does, go on Google and, and type in, what is MS? And so the, the things that you would see is people in a wheelchair or debilitate, and you'd see these big words, debilitating, chronic, yeah. incurable, and things like that. So for me, it was really just taking the time to understand my condition. For people who get newly diagnosed with MS, how can they begin to turn away from, um, you know, the umbrella term that you see on Google and other resources and start to maybe understand it within themselves kind of how to manage or cope with their, their condition? Simple answer, don't Google it, never Google MS. <laughs> I like that <laughs> it, is, uh, it can be really scary mm -hmm. to Google MS and you will see uh, n maybe not reliable information. You might read something that might put ideas in your head that is not quite there. Yeah. Um, if you are newly diagnosed, actually the MS Society or the MS Trust, they have reliable resources that are quite yeah. useful for a person who has been newly diagnosed. That is so important. That's a really, really important message. I wish someone told me that <laughs> <laughs> when I was diagnosed. That is really, really key. Next, changing my life for the better, I explored the different coping mechanisms to find out what works for me.